So welcome everyone and good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It's a real pleasure to moderate this panel. I know we're going to learn a huge amount from our wonderful panellists on what is really a very prescient topic. We are joined from around the world by four leaders in the field. I'm going to introduce them very briefly because I'm sure they're all familiar to you already. So first on my screen, Jose Francisco Caliche, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Dr. Dali Sambo Dura, Chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Professor Shin Imai, Director of the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project at Osgoode Hall Law School at York University. And Dr. Jonathan Liliablad, Associate Professor at ANU's College of Law. So first, I want to thank our panelists for their contributions and their time, and especially for those panelists for whom this is a really rather inconvenient hour. Today, our discussions will be structured as a round table. We'll touch on four different topics with one or two panelists leading the discussion of each topic and the others contributing examples or case studies from their experience. We'll leave a little time at the end for questions, but please post these as we go along in the Q&A function rather than the chat function, because we might be able to address them as we go along as well. Before I hand over to the panelists, I just want to spend a little bit of time setting the scene. Jonathan is going to walk us through the Earth Summit instruments in more detail shortly. The Earth Summit exhibited a concern with protection of the environment, with instruments focusing on climate change, desertification and biodiversity. If these were concerns at the Earth Summit, there is a growing consensus that they are really crises today. Reports state that since 1970, there has been a 68% decrease in population sizes of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish. In August of this year, the IPCC concluded that global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade and 2.2 degrees centigrade will be exceeded in the 21st century unless deep reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades, with the impacts that these temperature goals in the Paris Agreement were designed to prevent. A few years ago, reports showed that indigenous peoples comprising around five or 6% of the world's population protect 80% of global biodiversity. The indigenous peoples of the world also account for most of the world's cultural diversity. A recent IPBES report explains that nature managed by indigenous peoples and local communities is under increasing pressure. Nature is generally declining less rapidly in indigenous peoples lands than in other lands, but is nevertheless declining as is the knowledge of how to manage it. At least a quarter of the global land area is traditionally owned, managed, used or occupied by indigenous peoples. Among the local indicators developed and used by indigenous peoples and local communities, 72% show negative trends in nature that underpin local livelihoods and well-being. This panel is a moment to look at the intersection and synergies and tensions perhaps between environmental protection and indigenous persons' rights, where we've come from since the Earth Summit, where we are today and where we're going. You'll hear some key themes from our panelists today. What is empowerment, participation and involvement as encapsulated in the Earth Summit instruments and how are they realized for all groups? You'll hear about the core frameworks of self-determination, cultural and biological and ecological integrity. What is science? What is development? And do we need to readjust the way we think about some of these concepts? Is our starting point ecocentric or anthropocentric? Or is that really a false dichotomy? Have we forgotten in the way we live that our international goals and rights are self-professedly integrated and indivisible. As we take a moment to explore some of these concepts, 
it's also a chance to exhibit some of the openness that we saw a nod to in some of the Earth Summit instruments, to sit back and learn about different ways of considering concepts and ideas that are rarely scrutinized, as well as gaps in implementation. And with that, I'll turn over to Jonathan to give an overview of the relevant legal framework, including the Earth Summit instruments. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, uh, introduction, Meryl, and hello to everyone in the audience. Um, I'm speaking to you today from uh, Canberra in Australia, so it's uh, approaching 3.30 in the morning. Um, but uh, as part of that practice, I'll just make a note of this, that um, here in Australia, uh, you traditionally begin with, an, uh, with a reference to country. Um, and so by that, I mean that um, in speaking to you from the ANU campus, um, I'm speaking to you from the lands of the uh, Ngunnawal and Ambury peoples. And so we acknowledge the traditional ownership, their traditional ownership of this land and pay our respects to the elders past, present um, and emerging. And we also acknowledge the continuing issues of sovereignty, which I think is one of the themes that we'll, you will pick up on today. Um, so in introducing or uh, beginning the discussion today, uh, I'm trying to do a very brief summary about uh, the nature of the international legal uh, framework for indigenous rights, indigenous peoples and the environment. Um, and to do that, I think it is perhaps uh, uh, easiest to think about it in terms of a larger context of developments in international law. And uh, by the context, I refer to three general uh, trends within the international legal system that have taken place that affect uh, and impact indigenous rights uh, with respect to the environment. So the first uh, trend is the global indigenous rights movement, which has a very long history, but um, with respect to uh, the United Nations, really gather momentum uh, starting in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, what this has produced uh, since that time um, was uh, a series of efforts by the United Nations to promote awareness of indigenous issues throughout the United Nations system, uh, and also to encourage inclusion uh, of indigenous peoples uh, within uh, United Nations development policies. And so uh, what I refer to specifically um, as examples is the 1993 International Year of the World's Indigenous Peoples, which was then followed by two consecutive decades, the first and second decades of the world's indigenous peoples, and uh, which culminated in the 2014 uh, World Conference on, on Indigenous Peoples. So one of the byproducts of this uh, is that there is now a permanent forum on indigenous issues in the United Nations. So that uh, started in 2000, which serves as an advisory body to ECOSOC and coordinates the United Nations work on indigenous uh, concerns. The second trend that I'll make note of is the global environmental movement. Um, and uh, starting in the 1990s, it began to build momentum with respect to the recognition of the linkages between nature and culture. And uh, the tenant with that was also growing recognition of what's called rights-based approaches. So the, the connection of human rights uh, perspectives with environmental policies. Uh, this included indigenous rights. And so vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the work that came out of the Earth Summit in 1992, uh, we can uh, recognize that within Agenda 21, which is the Action Plan for Sustainable Development in Chapter 26, there was a call to recognize Indigenous peoples' uh, re relationship to the environment, but also to try and empower Indigenous peoples with respect to their participation in policy. This was matched by the Rio Declaration, uh, which was uh, declaring or setting guidelines, the principles, guiding principles uh, with respect to implementation uh, of Agenda 21. And then likewise also uh, called for recognition of indigenous people's relationship with the environment and the need to give them greater inclusion within decision-making processes of, of the United Nations. Um, the tenant with these were notably uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity, both of which were open uh, for, for signing in 1992. And with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, we now see a greater uh, presence for indigenous peoples in the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, so LCIPP. So this started in 2020, which is an advisory body. Uh, to, the, to, the, to the convention. Uh, with respect to the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, um, 
it, they, it preceded the efforts of the UNFCCC. In particular, there was the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, which started in 1996. And then in 2010, there was a Nagoya Protocol, which attempted to uh, uh, integrate uh, an access and benefit sharing mechanism for genetic resources, uh, which then also connected to the concern for traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. The third trend I'll make note of is the global human rights movement, which uh, also uh, try to promote greater awareness of the nature culture connection and also uh, a greater concern for rights based approaches within environmental policy. And uh, there in the 1990s, you began to see a greater momentum uh, to try and uh, make note of the presence or try to promote the presence of indigenous interests um, within uh, environmental policy. So the, the outcome of the human rights movement was um, the ILO Convention number 169 uh, from 1989, uh, which was, uh, it was a binding international treaty on indigenous uh, rights. And then the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007, which was a non-binding instrument um, regarding indigenous rights. In addition though, I'll just make note of this, it was that the Human Rights Council uh, began to create institutions for indigenous interests. So in 2001, there was a special rapporteur on indigenous peoples. So uh, Jose Francisco Calice is, is a, the representative today. Uh, in 2012, there was a special rapporteur on human rights and environment. So the current uh, person there is David Boyd. And then there was also the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. And so that started in 2007. The sum result of all of this is that we can now see that there is a uh, there has been progress with respect to international law instruments like uh, treaties and declarations, and also uh, international law institutions um, that uh, include um, indigenous voices. Um, so the kinds of rights that we see uh, are the ones that I think most of you will hear about. So the rights of self-determination, uh, free prior and informed consent uh, with anything involving indigenous interests. Um, non-discrimination, um, a right to culture, um, also gender equality. Um, however, and I'll make a cautionary note on this, is the current status is not complete, that this, this entire project is not complete. And so specifically what I'm referring to is there was a speech in 2013 by James Anaya at the World Conference, I mean, the World Indigenous Network Conference in, in Darwin, Australia. And at that time he'd said that uh, we had really only completed uh, stage one of a much broader and much longer term project. And by that, what we mean is that stage one was promoting awareness and recognition of indigenous rights, but that now what we are at is dealing with stage two, which is implementation. Uh, giving substance uh, to the indigenous rights. Um, so with respect to implementation, um, where we're at in terms of what's, what's going on um, and the kinds of things that are happening is that there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, there have been some keynote things. So re most recently at the IUCN World Conservation Congress this past September and for 2021, um, this was marked the first time that indigenous uh, peoples had voting rights within an international body. However, this is just one uh, case. Uh, similar things like this need to uh, appear elsewhere. Um, and in order for that to happen, there are a number of things that need to be resolved or addressed. And so just very briefly, just to finish my comments on this, is there needs to be um, some greater discussion and resolution about the issues of exoticizing or othering that um, non-indigenous uh, communities uh, continue to sort of deal with indigenous peoples at arm's length. That, that you know, it's, it's based on stereotypes, uh, romanticized Im images, um, and it essentially freezes or creates indigenous peoples as as uh, as museum pieces that are going to that are, are treated as objects. Um, that are fixed, when in reality, indigenous cultures are very dynamic, undergoing cultural flux, um, and very much uh, spaces that are being lived. The second uh, issue that needs to be resolved is a question of self-determination, so that there is a right to self-determination, but you know, what does that mean within a state-centric Westphalian system that is entirely based on state sovereignty? 
Uh, the third issue that has to be resolved is the question of partnership versus patronage. Um, and by this, what I mean is um, that there is uh, continuing to be an issue of token representation where indigenous peoples are accorded a presence in a lot of international decision-making forums, um, but then um, their concerns are never included within uh, decision-making. The participation is not meaningful. Uh, the fourth issue that also has to be res resolved is, is the continuing primacy and preference being accorded to scientific research and commercial advancement over uh, cultural property, uh, self-determination, and traditional knowledge. And it's basically, it's an issue about how indigenous concerns are addressed um, relative to um, the interests of scientific researchers and uh, corporations. The last thing that I'll make note of here also is, is a greater address as to the meaning of the nature culture connection. Um, increasingly, uh, a lot of scientific work that, that's being done is recognizing that um, anthropocentric interests, ecological integrity um, have existed and have been interrelated uh, over time. Um, whereas with indigenous peoples, this is something that's been well, well recognized and acknowledged. Um, throughout uh, our existence. And so this particular attention also has to be addressed. So I'll finish my comments there and um, I'll defer to anyone else on the panel. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, Jose, did you want to uh, add something on free prior and informed consent? Yeah, thank you very much. And I think that uh, uh, I think that free and prior and informed consent uh, or ethic, uh, as everybody mentions, uh, uh, operates fundamentally as a safeguard, safeguard uh, for the collective rights of indigenous peoples. Ethic appears uh, through, throughout the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People in relation to the most fundamental rights uh, the right of indigenous people to self-determination of the of their political, social, economical, economic, and cultural development, the right to consultation and participation, and the right to land, territories, and resources. Out of the 12 articles of the United Nations um, Declaration that uh, touch Epic Article 19, address uh, it most directly. It provides that the uh, state uh, shall consult and cooperate in a good faith with the indigenous people concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adapting and implementing leg leg legislatives or administrative measures that may affect them. Consultation and participation are also the, the cornerstone of the Indigenous and Tribal People Convention uh, 169 of the International Labor Organization. We require a state to consult with indigenous peoples in good faith with the objective of achieving their agreement or consent on projects that affect them. The duty of the state to consult is also grounded in indigenous people's right to be free from racial discrimination. Enshrine in core human rights treaties like um, the International Convention of the, on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. International bodies have clarified the meaning of free prior and informed consent as follows. Free <clears throat> means without intimidation, coercion, manipulation, harassment, or restriction of indigenous people's rights. Consultation must be conducted in good faith, free of threat, discrimination, criminalization, or violence. Good faith consultation requires a climate of confidence and mutual respect. Further, indigenous people have the right to be represented under their own customary law and traditional structures. Prior means starting the consultation at the early stage of the project planning before a decision is made to approve the project. Uh, indigenous people should be involved as early as possible to allow necessary time 
uh, to analyze and understand the information through their, their own decision-making process. Inform requires the information is sufficient, is sufficient and clear and include the nature, size, size, pace, reversi reversibility, and the scope of any proposed project or activity. Consultations should be undertaken using culturally appropriate procedures and presented in a manner understandable to indigenous, indigenous people that may require translation into indigenous uh, languages. Finally, it is important to note that indigenous people have the right to, to be consulted on projects that are proposed outside the land formally recognized by the state. Topic. Thank you for that <clears throat> deep explanation of um, free prior and informed consent that I think mm -hmm. links very nicely with a lot of the themes that, that Jonathan brought up, including mm -hmm. relating to self-determination. And Dali, you, would you like to? Yeah, it's on, on this point about the, the um, right to free prior and informed consent, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Francisco, for outlining in more detail uh, not only the, the substantive elements of free prior and informed consent, but also the procedural elements. And I think that both need to be taken into account, especially because free prior and informed consent is sourced in the right of self-determination. But I also wanted to make note of the fact that there are a couple of other C's inside uh, the provisions of the UN Declaration, and, and specifically the term control. If we think about uh, the term control, and uh, especially in relation to uh, determining the priorities for development within our uh, lands, territories, and resources, some of the other provisions specifically related to uh, lands, the, the term control typically does mean that you, you have authority over uh, all of that subject matter. So if we think about free prior and informed consent and the use of the term control in uh, the UN declaration provisions, um, uh, though it is not explicitly stating free prior and informed consent, control suggests that indigenous peoples have control. So I'm suggesting that not only are the explicit references to free prior and informed consent, but wherever the term control is used in the declaration is significant. In addition, the term cooperation, that states shall do X, Y, and Z in cooperation with or in collaboration with, which su suggests a, a, a partnership and not a, a unilateral imposition of something over indigenous people. So I think it's important for us to understand how these terms um, uh, entered into the UN Declaration, how they're understood and interpreted by indigenous people. So it's so it, in my estimation, free prior and informed consent is is not relative to only those explicit references. But if we think about control, if we think about in collaboration with, in cooperation with indigenous peoples, um, it, the, the notion of indigenous peoples engaging, especially in partnership is much broader than, um, than what might be suggested by others uh, as to the notion of free prior and informed consent. Thank you. Thank you, Dali. That was, that was an excellent explanation of the of the the scope of the principle, really, which is sits at the core of some of the principles that we spoke about in in the introduction and um, some of what Jonathan mentioned as well. Um, Shin, did you want to give an example of perhaps what happens when when some of these principles are not respected? I think you might still be on mute, Shin. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got a, a really good example. And I think this is a good lesson for lawyers out there uh, in terms of due diligence. If you're uh, uh, advising uh, investors in mining companies, shareholders, or if you're involved in an M&A 
uh, type of situation, uh, the due diligence you should do on these uh, the records of the mining company. And uh, this is one example from uh, Guatemala that I'm sure uh, Jose Francisco is very uh, aware of, a huge uh, 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 controversy over uh, the Escobar mine in, uh, that was uh, owned by a Canadian company called Tajo Resources. Uh, there were uh, a huge protests around the mine, uh, people uh, voting against the mine. Um, uh, at one point, the security guards of the mine shot six protesters in the back as they were running away. Um, and uh, meanwhile, all this time, the uh, uh, CEO was saying, oh, the communities love us. You went to their website, just happy pictures of happy Guatemalans. Uh, and uh, totally hiding uh, all the, uh, the disputes that were going on. Uh, so uh, the, uh, what happened is that, you know, at, at its height, uh, this uh, mine was trading at $25 uh, uh, per share. And uh, the, after the, uh, uh, finally, uh, the, the matter got to court and the constitutional court in Guatemala actually suspended the mine. And uh, it got suspended and it's four years ago, it's the second largest uh, 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 nickel mine in the, uh, sorry, uh, one of the largest silver deposits in the world. Uh, and uh, it, it's been shut down. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, Tahoe had to uh, sell and it got purchased by uh, Pan American Silver, another Canadian mine for $5. Uh, a share. Uh, so of course, there's all these lawsuits uh, by shareholders, uh, you know, saying that they hadn't disclosed, which the company had not. Uh, our, uh, I was involved in uh, three complaints to the uh, various securities uh, regulators about the lack of disclosure. And uh, it was a very public uh, in terms of uh, all, all the disputes were very public if uh, anyone went beyond the website of Tahoe, which is where your duty as lawyers come in, is that uh, if all you do is look at the website of the company, uh, you're doing an m and and you tell uh, Pan American Silver, don't worry, uh, it's, it's fine. They look like they're really great community people, people love them. You don't go behind that, you're not doing your job. And you're also uh, exposing yourself to uh, being a little negligent uh, and I think that this is a, a, a very important case. I have others that, uh, that I can explain, but I think that the lack of uh, uh, consent, uh, the lack of consultation was based on what Jonathan and uh, Jose Francisco mentioned, uh, International Labor Organization 169, which is not one that's very, it hasn't been adopted by very many company countries. But in Latin America, uh, the most of the countries in Latin America have, not all of them, but most have, Guatemala had. The country, the court looked at ILO 169, the Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples. It says that there should be con consultation. Uh, the state had not consulted, and so the court uh, shut it down. So that's, uh, that's my example. Thank you very much, Shen. So next we're going to move to um, another topic <clears throat> and we've heard um, from Jonathan and his excellent overview of many principles in a very short period of time about the importance of non-discrimination, about placing a gender lens on, on the, both the, the conception of the rights and also their implementation. And we've also heard a little bit about customary knowledge. And now Jose Francisco is going to develop that conversation a little bit more. And thank you very much. Uh, you know that uh, I will focus on indigenous women knowledge, uh, and this can be of a great value to the development of global climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and biodiversity conservation plans. Western society, uh, scientists, I'm sorry, uh, uh, and policymakers have uh, only recently begun to recognize this. And there is still a strong need uh, uh, for further research into this area. Climate change adaptation and mitigation plan must consider both the contribution of indigenous women's knowledge and the disproportionate environmental 
burden indigenous women bear and fully integrated this knowledge into all aspects of the environmental, environmental law and policy globally because uh, of the history of indigenous women exclusion from policy making process it will be it, it will take a substantial investment to meaningfully integrate their knowledge into into this space this work has already begun uh, exemplified by the uh, facil facilitative uh, working group of the local community and indigenous people platform which was established at COP24 for indigenous people and local communities to exchange best practices in climate change mitigation and adaptation. This group has emphasized a focus on engagement, inclusion and partnership with indigenous women and knowledge holders. States must follow, follow in this effort. International law, international law requires that we do so as a, a means of upholding indigenous women human rights. Indigenous women rights are being neglected at the local, regional and international level, despite being enshrined in international law through the UN declaration and the convention on the elimination of, of discrimination against women. Article 22 of the UNDRIP directs a state to pay special attention to how the declaration applies to the needs of indigenous women and to take uh, measures to ensure that the indigenous women enjoy fully or full protection and guarantees uh, against all forms of violence and discrimination. UNDRIP Article 21 spec specifies that the state must uh, pay attention to the right and special needs of indigenous women when taking measures to improve indigenous people's economic and social conditions. There is much work that needs to be done to fully recognize indigenous women, indigenous women's human rights, because we are currently uh, f falling very short of these standards. Globally, indigenous women still experience multiple discriminations. This has resulted in indigenous women suffering disproportionately high rates of extreme poverty and gender-based violence, and disproportionately lacking access to health, education, and other basic services across all geographic regions. In the context of meeting sustainable development goals, indigenous women are particularly vulnerable to climate change, disrupting their livelihood, and have limited opportunity to engage in education and income generating programs offered by development organizations. Priority should also be given to active actions aimed at implementing the rights to conservation and protection of the environment and the pro productive capacity of indigenous territories and resources. Conservation program promoted in indigenous territories should strengthen indigenous autonomy and respect the rights of a, a, to ethics. This program must also adapt a biocultural approach there is a correlation between the protection of cultural and linguistic diversity and the protection of biodiversity, which has been recognized by the Convention on Biological Diversity, Article 8J, stipulated that uh, the, commit, the commitment of a state to protect and, and promote indigenous knowledge as driver of biodiversity protections. Due to the fundamental role that indigenous women play in the transmission of indigenous languages and knowledge, it is essential to promote action that strengthens women's leadership and political participation. It is also necessary to promote uh, uh, policies to reinforce the transmission of indigenous languages and knowledge to future generations and to recognize the role of women as guardians of knowledge as a way to prevent and mitigate future negative effects of climate change. Despite, despite facing extreme uh, uh, marginalization, indigenous women have been leading their communities in their fight to protect their territories and natural resources. They have created network to support the recognition of their land, uh, of their, and to advocate for inclusion and international negotiation. Many face uh, criminalization, uh, uh, 
for defending their rights and protecting their lands, and in some cases suffer state sanctioned violence in relations. The most well known example in the, is uh, the murder of Berta Cáceres in Honduras. She led a successful campaign to stop the Aguasarca Dam from uh, being built on her people's traditional territories and was murdered in relation by a uh, hitman hired by the dam company. Uh, recently, COVID-19 emergency mandate, uh, mandate has been used as a basis of, for criminalizing indigenous people's rights, uh, defending activist, activities and confinement measures increase exp exposures uh, of land and environmental defenders to attack and killing. Indigenous leaders were reportedly assassinated in Latin America when perpetrators knew where they live and, they, and, and that they could not leave their homes. In Asia, threats against and harassment of indigenous tribe defenders have reportedly intensified, including against women leaders uh, providing aid and assistance. Because indigenous human rights defenders are in a particular high risk of violence, it is crucial that the provisions of ANDRI become fully incorporated into domestic law, most specifically Article 26, which recognizes indigenous people's right to their traditional land and territories. Recognizing indigenous land ownership and tenure will lead uh, to better protections for indigenous women and their important environmental and cultural knowledge. There are many ways that uh, state business and civil society can more meaningfully recognize indigenous women's rights and their specialized knowledge. More resources need to be devert, devoted to the study and understanding of, of this area. This is primary, a primary reason why I will devote one of my annual thematic reports to focus on indigenous women and their role as a knowledge keepers. Further international law and policy maker must identify what indigenous women specific needs are that will allow them to more fully participate in all levels of environmental planning and decision making. Some examples are devoting more resources to women specific, specific initiatives ensuring communication and information are shared in indigenous languages, providing accommodations such as meeting at times that work well for women, assisting with uh, child care, and providing transportation support. We all, we all must continue working toward a full recognition of the key role that indigenous women play in developing, transmitting, and preserving the knowledge that sustain indigenous people's resilience in the face of environmental degradation and climate change and protect their territories, natural resources, and the vitality of their culture. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jose Francisco. Um, Jonathan and, and Shin are going to share some examples from their experience related to this topic. Um, and maybe during that or afterwards, um, if, if it forms part of the examples and afterwards anyone else who wants to chip in, it would be really helpful to develop a little bit more this idea of inclusion. And Jose Francisco, you brought out some key themes about um, recognition of, of role, of rights, of land, communication, um, a different understanding perhaps of knowledge. Uh, they're just a few examples of some of the key themes you brought out, but if, if others would like to sort of develop a little bit more this theme of inclusion in this context, that would also be very interesting. Shin, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I don't have um, uh, much to add. I mean, the experience, uh, you know, to what uh, especially what Rapporteur said, uh, just uh, the experience uh, that I have is that they are, uh, uh, I've got many cases where women are the, the, the lead. Um, I know of many cases where women are leading the fight and thinking of uh, Maxima Acuna in Peru uh, against uh, Newmont Gold, uh, probably the largest or one of the second largest uh, gold mine in the world. Um, there's another case in Guatemala where uh, women have been uh, 
uh, alleging that they were gang raped by uh, uh, a Canadian uh, uh, security force of a Canadian mining company. And uh, uh, they've been leading an incredible uh, fight. Uh, and, and right now, as we speak, um, the, the Canadian mine, uh, after the lawsuits, had to sell at a loss. Uh, but um, it was taken over a Swiss company and uh, they're really pushing uh, now and the, the place is under military occupation. Uh, her house has been um, uh, shot at. Uh, a, a guy that uh, in the previous confrontation is in a wheelchair. I just saw a picture uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the police are raiding his place. He's in a wheelchair because he was shot by the security guards and there's a lawsuit in Canada about that. The police are in there again, uh, incredible uh, repression and, uh, and bravery uh, by these women. So, uh, you know, I know this is not address kind of in inclusion, but uh, I guess inclusion at the front lines. I mean, it is along the tradition of uh, Alberta Casares, which uh, uh, Jose Francisco mentioned. I guess really it's um, in, in the recognition of role, what you're saying is, you know, recognize the agency and the courage and the incredible part that can be played. That's right. Uh, uh, it, it's not a question of being victims, you know, I mean, they're, they're at the front lines uh, uh, leading the fight. Jonathan? Yeah, it's all I'll add to that, you know, the theme of, of agency um, as well. So as a matter of positionality, I'll just make a note here. So I come from um, the Pa'o peoples uh, of uh, Shan State in Myanmar. And in particular, uh, my family is, is coming from an area around Inlay Lake, uh, Town G, uh, which is an area that has, um, the lake itself has about 16 or 17 different indigenous uh, communities, uh, peoples that are coexisting together. Um, and uh, in that area, they're friends of uh, my family. They uh, have an indigenous women's organization. Um, and uh, they engage in a lot of uh, development activities for the indigenous women's uh, of the communities around the lake and uh, provide them training uh, to, as, a, as a way of facilitating income generation, um, socialization, solidarity, but then also uh, in the course of that, engaging in larger uh, community activities regarding environmental protection. Um, what was interesting to me though, is that um, they actually refused Western aid. They were, they were offered aid by uh, various Western organizations, um, USAID, uh, the World Bank, uh, several others. Um, and they said no, um, that they thought that the donor conditions uh, induced certain kinds of aid agendas that were problematic for their communities, that were not appropriate for their cultural uh, issues. And in, instead, they just simply decided to go ahead and engage in self-empowerment um, with their own agendas, their own um, uh, workshops, um, and their own um, activities. And uh, you know, and the way that they were maintaining cultural connection um, and, and sensitivity to the, the local context was that they would, they would negotiate uh, with the uh, local political administrators. Uh, they would negotiate with the cultural leaders of the communities. They would negotiate with the military officers uh, that were stationed um, and they were in control of the surrounding area um, uh, for, the, for, the, for their development work and for the gender uh, rights work that they were doing. Um, so based, and then in addition to this, they were also uh, constantly having uh, inclusive projects. So even though there was uh, women's only training, um, a lot of the community activities, they, they attempted to include um, husbands and sons um, and a lot of the work that was going on. Now, um, all of this has been, a, has been uh, interrupted by the uh, current situation in Myanmar right now. Um, and uh, it, you know what's it, what's not helping is that uh, the you know the Myanmar military is is a, is a institution of toxic masculinity that has basically uh, subverted this entire project. As a result of that, I have to keep um, the identities of the women anonymous. But um, the things that that tells me is that um, there was intersectionality that they saw cross issue linkages regarding gender rights, environmental conservation, uh, local development. 
Um, it also told me that they saw um, um, the need to engage with patriarchy and the political hierarchy, not to ignore it. Um, and also that it also uh, showed to me that the, the nature of self-determination, the nature of self-determination extends not just to political issues, but also to uh, the treatment of culture, right? And the, and the place of culture uh, within uh, development and political development policies. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I think you remind us there of some really important points in this context, particularly around um, intersectionality and the way that we think about that as well in the context of indigenous peoples and environmental rights. What does that really mean here? Um, Dahlia, did you want to add something on this topic or should we move to the next one? Sorry, you're also on mute as well. Okay, it shows that I'm, I'm online, but can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah, I just quickly wanted to say that uh, the preambular language of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which should be understood as the kind of the in, in, uh, interpretive framework uh, and the specific reference to recognizing that respect for Indigenous knowledge, cultures, and traditional practices contributes to sustainable and equitable development and proper management of the environment. If you think about that as a, as a, a context and again, an interpretive understanding of the whole of the declaration and you add the lens of gender in terms of our traditional practices, um, I mean, it's, it, it's really, infuses um, the whole of the declaration with some important elements that are revealed through the understanding of a cultural context of an indigenous peoples, an indigenous community, an indigenous uh, nation. And in our context, the important traditional practices and the role of women and the knowledge that they hold and the understanding of their own culture that they they carry with them. I mean, it, it has so many diverse elements uh, and in particular in relation to knowledge. I mean, from food preparation or from when to hunt. For, I mean, there, there's just so much packed in there. And we're talking about it in, in maybe to some extent in, um, in, in terms you know, relevant to the theme of this, uh, of this gathering. But I just want us to be mindful that there, there's so many diverse elements to, to gender, indigenous knowledge, our cultural context and our traditional practices. Thanks. Thank you. That's an excellent reminder. And um, I think we'll feed in nicely to our next topic on sustainability and development as well, thinking about this diversity within how we think about sustainability and, and development. Um, so Shin, I'll, I'll hand over to you for this uh, portion. And Perhaps we can also pick up a little bit in, in this topic, the theme of human rights defenders that came up in the last topic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Meryl. Um, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think in the, in the notes uh, around uh, how to discuss this, there were uh, discussions about, well, does it help to have Indigenous people on board of directors? And how about Indigenous people uh, being engaged uh, more uh, or participate more in the development of uh, uh, some of these developments? Uh, my experience is from mining. Uh, that's that's what uh, the just corporate accountability does. We just focus on extractive industries, and I'm just going to give you an example of a case in Peru that we've been dealing with the last ten years. So just to, to illustrate what the uh, what the problem is. So in uh, the mid '60s in uh, um, uh, Latin America, there was sort of a, a wave of land reforms, and so there there were these things called big haciendas, which were uh, 
um, owned by uh, you know Spanish and uh, uh, they had peasants working them. Well, to, in the reforms, uh, the peasants uh, were given the land to own collectively, and uh, uh, they're often they're called campesinos in lots of areas in Latin America and Mexico. They're hitos. Um, and so uh, they, they got the, these lands to own collectively. Um, the, uh, this particular community in uh, Cajamarca, Peru, that, uh, that we've been working with, uh, uh, had their land expropriated uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, they were paid $35,000 uh, U.S. Uh, by uh, Yanacocha, which is owned by Newmont or half owned by Newmont. Uh, American company. Uh, Newmont then mortgaged the land for $85 million. So that was the worth of the land. Uh, at its height, uh, Newmont was pulling in a billion dollars worth of gold from the mine. Now, if you go to the uh, Newmont website, they're all about how wonderful uh, they are, they're, they love the community, about all the wonderful benefits they brought um, to the community. Before the mine opened, Cajamarca was one of the poorest uh, regions in Peru. Uh, now, uh, 20, 25 years later, it's still one of the poorest regions. Uh, Cajamarca, the uh, Newmont has been uh, uh, brutal in, in terms of this community. Uh, uh, we started a lawsuit with respect to this, um, the payment of $35,000 for a piece of land that's worth 85 million. Uh, they fought us. Uh, they had the really high paid lawyers in Peru and the United States. They fought us all the way uh, on procedural issues. They said the community didn't exist. Um, and, uh, you know, on the other side, like we're volunteer lawyers, like we all have other jobs in JCAP. Uh, the lawyers in Peru are just volunteer lawyers. We're just this little ragtag group. When the campesinos have to go to Lima, we pay out of our own pockets for them to go to Lima. So it's not a fair fight uh, at all. So um, the, uh, uh, there's two, two points I wanna make from this story. One is this whole thing about community social uh, 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 CSR, corporate social responsibility. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a fig leaf. Uh, the, I can't, comment on whether every single mining and extractive company is bad because I haven't researched every single one. Uh, I know the ones that we deal with. I mean, we get the complaints, so there's problems with it. But the mining industry uh, never mentions names. They, they say we have a great record. We're very community oriented. They never mention names. They haven't done a study of all the companies either. So they can't say whether their mm -hmm. uh, corporate social responsibility uh, works or not. Uh, what I see is that these nice sounding guidelines and these companies get together and they have international groups of uh, like the uh, ICMM, like the International Council of Mining and Metals and uh, they participate in all these UN groups, you know, it's just wonderful. They believe in free prior informed consent, the equator principles, the banks, they all believe in all this wonderful stuff. Um, but none of it is enforceable. Uh, it, they're just words. And what I see on the ground is this quite ugly spectacle of, uh, you know, it's a carrot in, the, carrot in the stick. The benefits or bribes are offered to anyone in the community who are, will consent to the extractive company activity. And um, it's accompanied by really brutal formal and informal repression, uh, assassinations, uh, rapes. Uh, you know, when I'm talking about rapes, I'm talking about rapes by Barrick Gold, uh, which at one point was the largest uh, mining company in the world, massive gang rapes by its uh, uh, hundreds of women and uh, by in Papua New Guinea by its security guards. Barrack for five years did nothing. The woman went to annual general meetings and they said, look, this is gang rapes going up. Barrack did nothing. The head of Barrack says, well, what do you expect me to do about it? I've got 5,000 employees and gang rape is a cultural habit in Papua New Guinea. It only ended 
when law students from Columbia and Harvard went, investigated, documented, and then you got other organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, they finally admitted that it was happening and they started this process of, of compensation. Barrick and Newmont are the world leaders in CSR. They, they, uh, they fund uh, huge studies, they fund organizations, um, uh, they're, they're in anytime this kind of a voluntary CSR thing, they're in there, uh, they're funding it. So, uh, but on the ground, you see something that's really, uh, really very different. So, um, uh, so this brings me to my second point. How about more Indigenous participation? Would it help if there were more Indigenous people on boards? Would it help if uh, the while a mine was being developed, uh, you had an advisory committee of Indigenous people working on it. And I think that that would be better than nothing, maybe. But on the other hand, you're not changing the model. The whole point of a mining company is that it has to go ahead. They don't go there saying, oh, well, should we go ahead or not? All the financing, that they're getting, uh, sometimes they're under these tax pressures, they flow from financing, they have to get the mine going by the end of the, a certain term. There's all the pressures to get going on. And so there is not the, uh, an incentive to actually uh, consult. There's not an incentive to seek consent. There's an incentive to make it look like they're consulting, to make it get somebody, to pay somebody to get consent. And uh, I think that's, that is the problem. And so I think that these, these soft measures uh, uh, are really not effective. And in fact, they can't be effective because structurally uh, you have a situation where it's impossible to actually get consent. So, uh, um, you know, I mean, maybe this is a little bit of a depressing message in terms of sustainability and all that kind of thing. But uh, 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 I think that that, you know, it's by confronting the reality of the situation that we're going to find a solution, not by pretending that, uh, you know, companies saying nice things and, you know, building a, a school or building a hospital that doesn't, that they don't fund, uh, they don't fund uh, anything for drugs or for medical staff or nothing. They just build a building that they call a clinic and then put the company name on it. Or they, they put the company name, I've seen this, Canadian companies uh, gave out wheelchairs. And you know, oh nice, we're giving out wheelchairs, people need wheelchairs, but they've got the company logo on it, you know? I mean, these, uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's really a, a, a not a very happy situation. So I'll just end with that. Thanks, Shin. I think you, um, I mean, I, well, I'm going to hand over to Jose Francisco in a moment, but I, I think you remind us of the question, uh, sustainable development for whom? And um, how is that going to come about? And, and what does that actually mean to different people? Um, so I'd actually, we're, we're running a little over time, and I'd like to make sure we leave enough time for the next session. So Jose Francisco, I'm going to ask you to be a little quicker than perhaps the time you thought you were going to have. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, over the past uh, few years, a state has been committed to a new ambitious uh, area-based conservation target. This movement, uh, uh, known as the Global 30 by 30 campaign, is uh, committed by a state to protect 30% of the land and water by, uh, by the year 2030 as a way to, of stopping global biodiversity loss and slowing climate change. More than 70 countries have signed to this campaign, and the idea is quickly gaining traction in international conservation and climate change negotiations. However, if the plan does not center indigenous people's rights, it has uh, the potential to create conflict violence and escalate human rights violations all over the world. History shows us that uh, when a state created protected area, indigenous people suffer gross violation of human rights. Protected areas can take different forms in different countries, such as national parks and forests, wildlife refuges, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, marine areas, or NGO governance reserves. 
For centuries, the main idea underlining protected area has been that human rights cannot live in, a, in or use protected areas. Because this conceptualization of the protected areas is rooted in the colonial conservation approach that views protected area as a wildness that must be used or will not be used or occupied. This approach has led to the violent eviction and this possession of indigenous people worldwide. This happened in many countries over hundreds of years, beginning with the national park system in the United States. This forest conservation model lead, lead to human rights abuses, displacement, and militarized forms of violence. Unfortunately, as described above, this event still happen today, as in the case of the Kain Krachan Forest Complex, Thailand's largest national park. In 2013, the government requested the park be listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site with, without consult, consulting the local indigenous Karen peoples who live there. We received numerous reports that the Karen were being forcibly evicted from their communities, harassed and arrested by the state officials, and that an important Karen leader was killed after being detained by national park officers. We communicate this uh, information to UNESCO and urge the World Heritage Committee to the third Thailand's bid to get park listed as a natural World Heritage Site due to these ongoing human rights violations. However, in July 2021, UNESCO approved the request. Our report indicated that members of the Thai military and armed national park officers are continuing to harass and arrest Karen using checkpoint and video surveillance of the park to monitor, monitoring their movement and continue the, to refuse in, independent monitoring entry to the park. This experience of the Karen is a, an example of the dangers of the of what happens when state and international institutions like UNESCO ignore indigenous people's human rights. We need to move to a new right-based approach to the creation of, or expansion of existing protected areas. On this regard, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other international human rights instruments like the ILO Convention 169 must con constitute the minimal standard that a state need to implement in cases of creation of protected areas in indigenous territory. Uh, I think that uh, just to uh, uh, just to see that uh, including indigenous people in decision making about expanding protected areas is a mandate is is mandated by Article 18 and 19, which established that indigenous people have the right to participate in decision making in matters which affect their rights and that the state must consult and cooperate in a good faith with indigenous people to obtain their free prior informed consent before adopting and implementing any le legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. Consultation is also mandated by Article 32, which established that indigenous people have the right to determine, determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands and resources. As, uh, uh, as Daly was saying, is, that is the word that is very important, control of the resources. A state must learn from past mistakes, indigenous people, human rights must be at the center of any international negotiation around potential increase in a state protected areas initiatives like 30 by 30. And finally, there must be mechanisms for continuous regular engagement with indigenous people, including, including ensuring full and effective participation in the design, implementation, and monitoring of protected land initiatives. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. and thank you. And um, you remind us of some of the themes that Jonathan brought out at the beginning of a rights-based approach and the importance of partic participation and and having a voice and the fact that even though they were part of earlier trends in Jonathan's overview, perhaps they're not actually really here for all rights at all times. Um, Dali, it looks, do you have something to add? You've come off mute. Um, well, maybe I'll save it for uh, the, kind of the introduction of some of the Arctic issues, unless we're moving toward that now. But, yeah. um, we, we are, we're gonna move into the last section, which I think you're, you're leading on.
which mm -hmm. is on um, looking forward. But mm -hmm. before we go into the last section, I just want to provide the CLE code, which we were told to provide towards the end, which is 285360. I'm going to put it in the chat so everyone has it. Um, and um, as we go through this, this, this section, which is sort of our next section is sort of looking to the future, picking up on many of the themes that we've discussed. There are two questions in, in the Q&A <clears throat> that perhaps we can integrate into the answers and concluding thoughts. So one is about um, reconciling gender issues with Indigenous rights. Um, and an example here is that in Canada, if an Indigenous man marries a non-Indigenous woman, she cannot move onto the reservoir. Um, sorry, the reserve, apologies. I misread the typo. And um, then another one about consultation um, and the consultation of, um, with Indigenous peoples in Mexico during the construction of Tren, uh, Tren Maya. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, if, if those, perhaps all the speakers could touch on those in, in concluding remarks. And I've been told we have a, a few more minutes than then programmed. So um, Dali, if you, I hand over to you now, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm presently in Glasgow for the COP26. I'm the Arctic region member of the facilitated working group and um, the, the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. And for those that may not know, um, our traditional territory transcends uh, national borders uh, from Chikotka in the Russian Far East throughout Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. If you take a circumpolar Arctic view of the world we occupy in terms of our traditional territory, uh, just over 40% of the Arctic. And so the issues uh, related to environment are, are crucial to us. Um, and I think that the, the Issue, for example, that Francisco just now talked about marine uh, protected areas or protected areas, conservation areas. We have a lot of concerns about how those have been emerging and that colonial nation state of mind in contrast to uh, indigenous perspectives. Um, but I, I really want to turn toward um, the looking forward and um, also state that I agree with how Jonathan characterized um, some of the, the issues and themes that have emerged um, as far back as first contact really, uh, but more significantly um, as far back as 1992. The Inuit were at uh, the Conference on Environment and Development where um, all of these international treaties concerning the environment were spawned and we were uh, trying to pry the doors open, largely because we already were beginning to see the impacts of climate change throughout our homelands, the coastal seas and, 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 and our homelands. And so there have been some advances and, and some uh, important developments since 1992. And it's largely because of the progressive development of international law. And the fact that indigenous peoples did pry open the doors of the United Nations to uh, provide our cultural context to the whole human rights regime. So uh, we, we should all be grateful that we have this important tool, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But I do want to underscore that this international human rights instrument is intimately tied to the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and ILO Convention Number 169. And each of these respective uh, uh, entities, intergovernmental organizations have proclaimed themselves that they're intimately tied. And I think we should keep this in mind when we're defending indigenous peoples in their communities in the face of extractive industries like Shin has, has spoken of. But in the UNFCCC, one thing that is significant is that indigenous peoples are now formally recognized as a constituency. And this is an important dynamic in terms of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. And uh, the, the recognition as a formal constituency is significant. And uh, in relation to the facilitative working group, um, 
indigenous peoples are the parties or the constituency that identifies and brings forward indigenous leadership and their representation within the facilitative working group without any UN member state oversight, which is in direct contrast to what happens at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues or the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, the, the, these appointments um, have to clear the hurdle of, um, you know, the president of the General Assembly or the or uh, the chair of the Human Rights Council. In contrast, the facilitative working group members are brought forward by Indigenous peoples, and they serve in equity with member state parties. So this is a huge advance, in, in my opinion. I know the International Union for Conservation and Nature was addressed earlier, and I want to point out that this there's so many opportunities within this union because it's not restricted by uh, UN member states and, and UN uh, rules of, of procedure and so forth. But going to um, examples from the Arctic and, and for my people and the Inuit Circumpolar Council, we are very much invested on safeguarding the marine environment. We uh, rely upon the marine environment. Uh, the, the sea ice, the coastal seas are crucially important to us because of the marine mammals that we uh, sustain ourselves with, as well as, uh, as the, the wild salmon. Um, so we've made uh, the priority of uh, protection of the Arctic marine environment uh, uh, it's significant and we put a lot of attention to this. We're engaged internationally um, in terms of trying to influence the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and this ongoing discussion about biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which is, which is, is underway now um, because everything is interrelated, that these ecosystems and the Arctic Ocean, they're interrelated. We're also involved in the International Maritime Organization. We presently have a, uh, a request for um, observer status at the IMO, uh, largely because of the polar code, uh, as well as um, the fact that they control a lot of activity in the marine environment. Uh, there's a whole host of guidelines and, and um, uh, treaties and, and, I mean, it's a long list of areas where we need to be involved. Heavy fuel oil is a, is a perfect example. As climate change impacts our region and the opening up of uh, increased vessel traffic, which we're already seeing and have been seeing for some time, we have to be uh, on the spot and, and monitoring uh, what takes place within the IMO. I also wanted to point out the Central Arctic Ocean Agreement, a new international treaty. Our organization, Inuit, I should say, not the ICC, but Inuit specifically, managed to stumble into this negotiation and the outcome as a new international treaty of the, the five Arctic littoral states plus five managed to include a reference to the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also a specific and explicit reference to Indigenous knowledge. And I posted in chat the ICC's definition of indigenous knowledge, and that's the term that we prefer to use because our knowledge is not only past, it's present, and it also has uh, future uh, elements. So um, we've, we've seen some extraordinary advances uh, in this regard, but at the same time, there are huge challenges, even within the Arctic Council, where we're recognized as permanent participants. They, they IUCN and the voting rights of indigenous peoples organizations is huge, it's significant. This is the kind of issue that we're looking at within the Arctic Council to up the game in terms of uh, ensuring uh, our direct advocacy for our rights and our perspectives within uh, the Arctic Council. We have had a tremendous difficulty in uh, 
ensuring the ethical and equitable engagement of our knowledge in these various different fora, including uh, the UNFCCC. Uh, I'm grateful that as a facilitative working group member, I was able to co-lead with the Government of Canada a series of webinars on the ethical and equitable engagement of Indigenous knowledge in order to uplift state party capacity in this area. And it's not about building the capacity of indigenous peoples because we're the experts when it comes to indigenous knowledge, but it's building the capacity of state party members. So I was just grateful for that, that opportunity. I just some closing remarks in terms of um in terms of the 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 way forward. I think um we have to overcome this dynamic that's happening in every intergovernmental fora. And that is the linkage and the conflating of indigenous peoples and local communities. Now I have no problem with local communities. If they wanna become a, a force and undertake a political enterprise to influence something, more power to them. However, I want to acknowledge and give credit to indigenous peoples and the triumph in gaining the UN Declaration, the American Declaration, the ILO Convention, and safeguarding the rights that are distinct to us as indigenous peoples. And I think every state government on earth knows what we're talking about. They know um, uh, what degree of influence we had over these different uh, processes. And so it's, it's important to ensure that they're not given any leeway in the use of the term local communities, because more often than not, they're using it to, de to deny the status, rights, and role of indigenous peoples within their borders, and also to diminish the rights of indigenous peoples in whatever context they possibly can. So I think we have to be really careful uh, about how this is done. My concluding remark is that we have seen too much in the way of rights ritualism. And Hillary Charlesworth um, is, uh, is uh, she's brilliant. And the discussion and the writing that she and her colleagues have done in rights ritualism and the human rights uh, processes, the human rights regime is something we have to be mindful of and to really use this as an area of focus to ensure that we can cut the rights ritualism out of the human rights regime that we've uh, worked to contribute to so that we can gain that implementation of the UN declaration and that indigenous peoples, because of the progressive development of international law, can effectively exercise and enjoy their fundamental human rights in their own homelands and express their right of self-determination in all of these fora that we've been talking about. And, and the, the, the right, we see the rights ritualism happening just down the street at the COP26. We just earlier uh, had a discussion about an explicit reference of indigenous human rights in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. We haven't made a, a step forward and we'll be lobbying for this. But in terms of, um, uh, of her work in this area of rights ritualism, I think we all have to recognize that this is this is an ongoing challenge that we have to uh, ensure is curbed um, and, and comes to an end so that we really do uh, gain the respect and recognition of the rights that we have uh, collectively uh, fought for and gained in these different international human rights instruments. Sorry to be long-winded and uh, just appreciate the opportunity to have shared at least some, uh, a little glimpse of uh, what we're facing throughout uh, the circumpolar Arctic or Inuit Nunat, our homeland. So, Kriyanak. Well, thank you so much, Dali. Um, I, I understand we're completely at time now, so um, unfortunately we're going to have to um, end here, but I, I think you've probably concluded perfectly for us. Um, and this is about, you know, we go back to the overview that Jonathan gave at the beginning, <clears throat> and we come to this ending idea of the realisation of rights, and this is a 
something looking forward, something we're seeking to do um, in all of the different ways that you've discussed and expressed throughout this panel and, and the benefits and, and what we gain to learn for the protection of the environment through doing that. So um, I, it's been a wonderful panel. You've been, I've learned so much from listening to all of you and I'm sure all of the audience have as well. And so thank you so much for your contributions and Jonathan, I hope you get to go to sleep now. Take care everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.